this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes, actually. It's from 1969. And it's maybe even more relevant today than it was then. But I usually leave it up on the screen when I'm having this presentation with young people because I think that your generation is an extremely important generation now because you're going to determine what's going to happen to the future of this planet. That's You'll be the most powerful force in determining that. And the reason I think that you're the most important generation is that I see us being on a path on the human journey and we have two possible, we're at a fork and we have two possible paths. And one path continues along the path we're on where wealth is concentrated, corporations are becoming more and more powerful and the planet is essentially controlled by a handful of very, very wealthy people and multinational corporations who are bent on producing maximum profit and maximum growth for themselves, regardless of the impact on the planet. The other path is not a path where corporations control the planet, but where communities control the planet, with their goal being that providing a dignified lifestyle for everyone on the planet, and a sustainable planet, and a sustainable economy. And that's more of a utopian vision, but I think it's possible. And um, I think it's important um, that uh, people in my generation, those of us who are connected and who were activists ourselves and who were your age, to reconnect and suggest ways that we think that your generation, and particularly your group, might be a catalyst that can begin a movement that could create a very powerful youth movement along with other groups that would connect with you to begin to move this planet in a different direction. And the reason that I think it's good to talk about that possibility is because some of the speeches at the march in Washington from the younger folks, Emma and a few of the others, and even here in Northampton said, this is not going to be just about school shootings. This is about something much larger. And we're going to move in a different direction and we're not going anywhere. We're here for the long haul is essentially what they were saying. And if in fact those folks are up for the challenge of trying to create something broad and wonderful and sustainable and loving and caring, then any input that they have to do that might be helpful to them. And so that's how this conversation began, actually, because I sent an email to Youth Rise together and uh, said if I have some thoughts and if you're interested in listening to them, I'd be interested in sharing some time. And so I got a response back from a person named Alex Davis and Carol, and I said, well, let's get together with this person. I wasn't sure if it was a young man or a young lady at that point, because Alex would be either. And so we arranged to meet up in Greenfield at the coffee shop, and in walks a young man, 14 years old, and we were rather impressed and said, all right, this is great. This is, this is what we're looking to do. We're looking to connect. So uh, one conversation led to two conversations, and now we're leading to a third conversation. And what I'd like to do is walk down a path that might suggest some possibilities to create and to provide an agenda that your generation can put out there for others in your generation and if that resonates with your generation then others are going to follow you particularly my generation will follow you and the reason I feel that is because I've seen things that have occurred over the past few years that say there's a tremendous amount of energy out there to move in a different direction and the first time I saw it, 
and I became convinced that it was there, despite the fact that we've been doing this, my group, E2M.org, has been doing this since January 1st of 2000. More recently, what reinforced my mind, in my mind, that the time has come, is the Occupy movement, the Occupy Wall Street movement. Now, you folks were younger at that point in time. I forget how many years back that was. But um, that movement began with a group of young people that occupied Liberty Plaza in New York below the windows of the towers of Wall Street. And Jose, as a matter of fact, was one of the first people to occupy that park. He was there from day one. And it went from a handful of people, and more and more people came in, and soon that park was full of people, and the police were being cooperative, and they were there for several weeks. But the interesting thing about it that really struck me, and uh, I tried to, oh, I went there one evening, I drove out and was hoping to address the General Assembly, but they they had other issues they had to deal with, namely 3,000 pounds of laundry on the sidewalks that the police said, you have to do something with the sidewalks, we're trying to work with you folks, but we can't have dirty laundry on the sidewalks. So the key discussion that when I was, how do we get enough quarters to clean 3,000 pounds of laundry? But um, what, what my interest there was, was to kind of discuss and tell those folks that I was 65 at the time, I'm a few years older than that now, that when I was 25, I was doing the same thing they were, which was being in the streets and getting in their faces out there. These were the anti-war years. And this was uh, lots of people in the streets. Um, um, and uh, um, it took us maybe four years, even five years, before we could say with any credibility that the whole world is watching. But the folks in Liberty Plaza were able to say that with credibility in two weeks, three weeks, because people were getting off of their couches in London and going down to Piccadilly Square and holding up their Occupy signs. And they were doing that in Sydney, Australia and in Tiananmen Square, and in Paris. And people of all ages were getting out saying, we're with you kids. We're with you kids, holding up their Occupy signs. So that showed that there was this huge amount of energy around the planet that said, lead us. Take us to where you think we should be, because we know where you want to go. And unfortunately, because things happened so quickly, and it was such a surprise, I think, that so many people jumped on board around the planet that didn't have really a great answer. There were many issues, and after this we can talk about it, and Jose can give you some insight onto that, but there was no real answer to, yeah, join us, here's where we're going, and you can come with us. Had they had the answer that would have resonated with everybody, regardless of age, regardless of color, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of political affiliation, if they could have found the common thread amongst everybody, they would have had a great movement that would have developed from that. The second time that I saw something that says there's tremendous energy out there was Bernie's campaign. And unfortunately, his nomination was taken from him. But he won the nomination in numbers, but that's not what the Democratic National Committee wanted, so he didn't have that. But if you went, did any of you have a chance to go to any one of his? So it was like he could, you know, Mick Jagger gets that same response when he walks out on stage. Which one did you go to? Springfield. Oh, in Springfield. And, you know, the flags are waving and the young people are there, and it was like, Oh my God, it made me feel like the things were happening in the 60s. And I said, it's happening. It's finally happening. Because my generation of those of us who are activists have been waiting. And so, unfortunately, that didn't go where it should have. But it showed that that energy is there. And the last time I saw that energy was when your generation, starting with Parkland, that turned into a million people occupied 
the mall in Washington at the march for our lives. And it was the most incredible thing. And of course it was based on school shootings, but there were other conversations there that said, we're going to take this someplace else. And so the same energy that was behind Occupy and that was behind Bernie was behind those young folks, you young folks, in Washington. There were 800 other locations around the planet that were having uh, 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 get-togethers and demonstrations in support of what was happening in Washington. So it's out there. And I thought, well, I think I happen to be in a space myself where something has been given to me as a gift to pass on that might help to create a vision for something and a, uh, a dialogue that could help consolidate all of the young folks that want a different future and to also connect with us and the generations in between that will follow you. So I want to talk about that and that's what this presentation is. And um, um, we're going to talk about some utopian ideas. So at some point I just want to give you a quick introduction to myself, but uh, I wanted to start with some quotations from other people. And one of them was uh, uh, Archbishop Tutu. And uh, he spoke at, um, at Springfield College and he said, I salute you and say, please remain idealistic. He came to see the young people, AIC, so he came for young people. And he said, many young people believe it is possible for there to be a world without war. They believe it is possible to have a world without poverty. I say to you, don't be infected by the cynicism of oldies like us. Dream of a different kind of world, a world in which all God's children, our sisters and brothers, have enough to eat, have enough clean water to drink, and have a good education, good health care. It's possible. And when I was there and I heard those words, I said, that's very nice. It's a nice thought. I really like it. Everybody in the audience liked it. Um, but I'm a farm boy, and it was drilled into my mind, you have to do things to get things done. You just can't stand there dreaming. You have to get things done. So I think that what this statement is, is a wonderful statement, and it's a wonderful thought, but it doesn't say how. And until you can show people how that can actually happen, this is not as powerful as it could be. And that's what this meeting is about. It's about laying down a possibility of how this could happen and how your group could begin and become a catalyst to something greater. So I do want to quote someone else who's one of my favorite people, and that's John Lennon. And you've heard his tune, Imagine. And I think that what he's telling us to imagine is possible. And so when we formed E2M back in January of 2000, E2M is an economic model. Because the way we see things, whoever has the capital has control of society. It's all about the money, unfortunately. Politics is driven by the super wealthy. Politics is driven by money. And so in order to be as powerful as possible, you have to work in an economic solution as well as a political solution, but the economic being more important. And what we're saying is imagine an economy with communities more powerful than corporations and people more valued than profits. If we could create that, we could do amazing things. And we once imagined it, and we said, now we're creating it. And we did that over the next 20 years, or 18 years. And I want to show you how. But understanding that there's a bit of utopian conversation here, Maybe we just touch quickly on me because I have, I'm an inventor and I have, uh, all inventors have a certain number of toes off the ground. I have seven on and three off. 
and the seven on allow me to do what we're just going to quickly skim through. And the three off are the ones that allow me to dream, and those are my favorite toes. But from a seven on point of view, what I have done in the past, I've had a number of businesses. I've employed 400 people. I've got nine worldwide patents. We did a joint venture with the largest company in the world. They discovered me. And one of the more, the more recent companies was Neon Technology, which I created an invention for creating a different form of light. And that light was going to be plates of glass that would go into the ceiling, which emitted light that would last 100 years. But there wasn't a real market for it. So instead of continuing down that path, we, what we did is we engraved images in plates of glass and fused plates to, together to create channels that we filled with neon and we created the world's first flat glass neon signs. That's what neon signs look like before and currently look like and that's what neon signs look like using my technology. And these are some of the companies that we did business with. We sold these all over the world either indirectly ourselves or through the other company, Tocho, which was the largest in the world in 92. That was the one that they saw, which is when I realized we were really international because I don't even know what these words say. But they went, that went off to Japan. But we worked with Coca-Cola, Guinness, General Motors. This is a plant we built in Australia to produce the, the, the technology there, Zildjian symbols. Sprite, Surge was Coke's response to uh, uh, um, uh, Mountain Dew, Burt, and those guys up there, Adidas. So these are the types of things we did. Then I decided I didn't want to be a commercial entrepreneur. And there were some issues in Asia with the economy that required that I close that company because my Japanese associates that, joined, that did the joint venture had to cancel a number of joint ventures that they were doing. So I joined with and took my first job in my life at the Valley CDC where my job was to help uh, low to income people start businesses and over a period of 30 months we helped uh, all of these people start businesses. Everyone low or very low income rejected by banks previously and we came up with a half a million dollars to lend to them all to form these businesses in East Hampton which had a 50% vacancy rate in the downtown business district when we came in and 30 months later they had to build a new parking lot and there were no spaces to rent. And then I was also, and East, uh, um, uh, at that time there was a recession in the rest of the valley, and the question was why is East Hampton doing so well? And this article uh, by Judson Brown in Business West said that one, the third most popular reason based on surveys of the community was the strong local presence of my office. The first was the change of the government from a, may, a town meeting select board to uh, a mayoral, then grants, city receiving grants, much of which I got for this. And um, I also worked with the Anti-Displacement Project. That's a group of 1,450 families, all very low income families, that have control of four large housing complexes throughout the valley. And my job was to teach them how to use their $40 million in assets and economic power to achieve their social goals. And for that, this is a group of us uh, heading on up to see uh, Senator Kennedy uh, and Senator Kerry in the, uh, in the uh, um, uh, executive office building in Washington. That's the freight elevator because the front elevators wouldn't fit them all. And they all insisted we're going up in the same elevator and we're getting off, we're getting off as a group, we're getting off as a group. So the folks said, you got to go up the freight elevator. So that's the picture I took of them as we were heading up to the freight elevator. I also did some work very recently, a year ago, with uh, resettled immigrants, helping them start small businesses. And Business West magazine did a story on uh, Google and um, Mina here, they came from a Bhutan, uh, a uh, refugee camp, and we had a number of people that we helped start businesses. So that was my history, but after I closed my neon company, I began to look at the world around me, because previously I had people out there and I didn't see what was going on in the real world, I only saw what was going on in my company, and once I walked out, 
I said, whoa, things aren't really very cool out here nowadays. And that's when I became a social entrepreneur, and I took that job at the Valley CDC. And this is a quote from Bertrand Russell, which says it's a healthy thing now and then to hang a question mark on the things you have long taken for granted. And it's about time we hang a real big question mark on where we are on our human journey. And so uh, that's where I began, and my uh, life changed. And what happened was I had an epiphany when I closed my neon company. I said, God, I never want to invent another object. I'd like to have an idea that can, could do wonderful things for the world. No freight, no weight, no factories, no employees. Just an idea that can do great things and travel around the planet effortlessly. And so I left it at that. I left it open-ended. And it came to me in bits and pieces over the next six months uh, from the time I closed my factory to the time I took my job at the Valley CDC. And much to my surprise, when I really understood what it was, it was an alternative economic system. Now, I've only taken one economics course in my life, so the concepts that came through in pieces, to me, came from another place. And um, so uh, what it made me realize and what, what, I, what I did is it made me realize we need to get an organization. So one person became three. Uh, interestingly enough, we have one and we have three here too. Then became eight and became many more than that. And um, we gained the control of uh, the, the cooperation and control of a number of people. And what um, our basic premise was is that it's easy, there's, that there's one root cause that's most uh, 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 causing uh, causes of uh, many other problems that are more difficult to deal with. Hunger, poverty, pollution, v rampant consumerization, uh, um, uh, resource wars, uh, uh, unsustainable economic systems, ecological problems, we saw that there was one root cause that created a lot of those problems and it was easier to fix the root cause than it was to um, fix any one of the many, many problems it causes. And we saw the root cause as this, that our current economic system is unsustainable because the goal for investment is to produce maximum profit and maximum growth for the benefit of relatively few investors. This whole economic system is about making as much money as possible for a handful of people and corporations regardless of the impact on the planet. And if these corporations don't do that, they can be sued. And uh, um, the quest for maximum profits and growth leads to the unsustainability you see today because it requires continually increasing the purchases from consumers to achieve growth. If the GDP, the gross domestic product, isn't growing, this economic system is considered unhealthy. And because most of the purchases made and what affects the, and grows the GDP are individuals' purchases of goods and services. So people must continue to consume in order for the economic system to grow and be considered healthy. That's why you see uh, consumer confidence used a lot as a term when they're discussing economics and particularly recessions. Oh, we're having the recessions because consumers don't have confidence right now. They stop buying. And if we stop buying more and more and more, the economy tanks. So it requires continually increasing purchases. It drives consumers with unprecedented amounts of debt into increasing levels of debt. Because after a while, you stop running out of cash to buy stuff. And that happened years back, so that's when they came up with credit cards. Hey, we'll give them credit cards. They can mortgage their future as long as they continue buying now. It also results in rampant consumerization, excess resource consumption, pollution, and waste. Because maximum profit isn't enough. If you have profits this year, this system wants more profits next year and more the year after because you, they want to increase, maximize profit. And finally, it creates the inequities of wealth 
access to food, medical care, education, and opportunity, because as corporations create more and more wealth and money for themselves, there's less money out in the system for the rest of us. We get the crumbs. Because the growth of the economic system requires more and more consumer and purchasing, um, I want to talk about a comment that Bill Clinton made. And he said that between 1980 and 2001, the economic system expanded more than in any other time in, U in U.S. history. And there's a chart that shows these bars. Now, is this a chart of economic expansion? It certainly could be based on what the economy did then, but no. It is a chart of household debt in trillions. So as that economy expanded from 81 to 2001, household debt went up and up and up because people didn't have enough cash to continue to buy. And of course, they're trained to buy since they're stuck in front of the television when they're two years old watching Sesame Street. And um, um, buying is built into their minds. So they went into debt to do it. So that was from 2000, from 1955. And you can see, this is where they ran out of cash. When I was a kid, we used cash. There were no credit cards. If you didn't have cash, you didn't buy stuff. And then the credit cards came in. And that's when you can begin to start seeing this growth. And you can see that it's an ever-increasing curve. And this was up to 2005. So from 80, we went from about a trillion dollars of household debt to 11 trillion in 05. And here's what it looks like as of 16. This is, so people are continually indebted, and that's how you control a population. You control them through debt. Because if you're in debt, they can take your house from you anytime you want. They can sue you anytime they want. And so debt is the way you control a population in the democratic system. Under communism, you do it a different way. But this does the exact same thing. It can just, and so this household debt, so the question really is, is this a sustainable system? If our economic system requires increasing debt to be considered healthy, is that sustainable? sustainable? Does anybody here think it is? See, whenever I ask audiences, no one ever raises their hand. <laughs> Not once. Not once has anybody ever raised their hand. And so I said, well, if it's unsustainable, that means it's going to end. And what does it look like when it ends? And those answers go anywhere from, I don't care, I'm too old, I'll be dead by then, to war or, or revolution or uh, constant recession and uh, social malaise. So, the fact is, is that it is unsustainable. So the, the uh, um, and if you look at the numbers, this is back in 2001, the concentration of wealth, less than 1% owned more than half of all the private property. It's much more than that now. 88 families own as much wealth as the poorest 90% of people on the planet. That's where we're getting. That's why people don't have money. That's why it's hard to have a sustainable small business, because there's so little free cash flowing around out there that it's harder and harder to pull a buck out of the system, because it's in the hands of large investors, very, very rich, the one-tenth of one-tenth of one percent, and corporations who are sitting on trillions of dollars, and they're not spending it because they're waiting for the next shoe to drop. So uh, one percent of the... In 1% of the U.S. population own 50% of all the investable liquid capital in the country. Are we going to change the laws? Well, if that was going to happen, it would have happened a long time ago. So what we need to do is find new investors that will accept a different criteria for investment, that don't demand maximum profit and maximum growth for a handful of people. And it's the easiest path to go because we already have a system that we can use against itself and create a parallel economy where we can begin to get this investor to grow and to join. Now, the reason I say that you can't dismantle the system is because we tried. 
And we went down to Washington in May, there were 250,000 of us. We went down May 2nd of 1971, had some concerts the night before, and the next day we had said to the government, okay, we've been nice to you long enough, you're not going to stop your war, you're not going to stop this baloney, we're coming down to shut this city down. And this is what happened. They arrested 7,000 of us just on Tuesday. They arrested 12,000 in all. And actually, it was great for me to see this picture on the Washington Post, because I saw it in real life, because I was standing near the mall that day. And I watched these Marine helicopters, the same ones that they were using in Vietnam. Hueys deploy these Marines with fixed bayonets and live ammunition, 180 of them. So that's what happens when you try to shut down the government forcefully. So that doesn't work. So what we need to do is we need to find a new investor who will accept a new goal for investment, which is adequate profit, sustainable growth for the good of all. And if we can get an investor to do that, then we can create significant positive change. And because whoever has the capital has control of the system, once you get enough money that is controlled under this, you have the control of the system. Then the politicians will follow you, because politicians follow the money. So if we create a great new investor that's altruistic and is investing with a sense of love and caring and sharing, as opposed to greed, which is maximum profit, maximum growth, then the politicians will follow them too. And so will everybody else on this planet who's sick of being in debt or sick of having to search all day to get a cup of rice and uh, who wants a different future. And that new investor is the regional community. You, the community will invest based on adequate profit and sustainable growth for the good of all because if it doesn't, it's going to die like it's doing now. Communities are falling apart. And so basically what we have done and what came as the epiphany was an economic system that I designated as E2M on January 1st of 2000. And I'm not the only one that feels that a new system is required. Bill Gates said the same thing. We need a new form of creative capitalism that balances the needs of the market with the needs of, the, of those the market leaves behind which is all of the folks who are falling through the cracks, as well as the planet. And when we formed E2M, when I formed E2M, when it was one person, then I got together with three, and then eight, and then began to put a little manifesto out and pass it around, people came on board, and I had John Alva uh, um, uh, uh, came on board. He was the first uh, um, a politician. This is a quote from him. In writing, during the past eight years, I've watched E2M grow from an idea into a new, innovative, and voluntary economic option for our region. These efforts merit support. I am excited to see how the initiative can grow. And not only did John come on board, and he asked me to put one of his uh, people on, my, on the E2M org board, which is a nonprofit I formed, but Stan Rosenberg had, and he wasn't Senate President at the time, and he isn't now, but uh, he had a member on the board, Mary Jane. She was brilliant. Ben Swan from Springfield, a representative, uh, came from the core back in the uh, uh, civil rights movement, Ben. Uh, he came on the board. And we had economists, Julie Graham. We had labor leaders, Garrett, Jason Garrett. We had uh, uh, students and we had young people on the board and community members. So we put that board together. And the job of that board was to take my initial vision, which was roughly stated, and to fill in all of the details and all of the policies and all of the procedures necessary to create regional economies controlled by the community that could create as much wealth as they wanted, to create huge amounts of community wealth in regions around the country that could be used within that region or that all of these individual regions could use to get together to do more uh, uh, larger initiatives like do a hostile takeover of large corporations. So it's all about creating local economic systems that create wealth that can be used locally but also works with um, um, uh, uh, other regions around the country and the world. 
and we're going to talk about what, how that works. But, so E2M is a community-driven economic model for the new millennium that enables communities to create enormous amounts of citizen-controlled wealth for community investments. Now, what could communities do with this investment money? They could invest in local startup businesses in partnership with entrepreneurs and employees. So we could support young people and older people too, just like those businesses of those low income people that I helped form. And we could build many smaller businesses that keep money locally. We could provide low interest loans to companies that come into the new system, like 0% interest. We could hire and train. Uh, inner city residents to rehab inner city properties and also other properties in rural areas that they could purchase. And we could provide mortgages to those folks at 1% rates over 50 years so that a house, $200,000 house, would cost $400 a month or an inner city condo could cost $25 a week. Now, if an inner city condo can cost $25 a week, why is there any need for homelessness? If you can build condos and sell them for 20, and that's ownership. We're not talking about renting, because what's happening now is the government is paying $600 a month, 150 a week, for Section 8. And the folks that are in Section 8 don't own that. They have no, no value in that, really. They can't sell it and move to a next level of wealth. If communities had wealth, we could do this with these mortgages. Um, we could purchase commercial realty and, and provide stable rents to local small businesses for decades. Look at Northampton. Northampton rent in 1972 was $2 a square foot for first floor space. It's now $40 to $50 a square foot because max profit, max growth caused these places to be bought and sold. If the community had owned that space, they could say, look, we're going to keep this rent stable because we're not trying to maximize profit and growth. We're trying to create opportunities for small businesses to produce nice products to sell to local people and create local jobs. And if we can keep the rent stable for years, that's fantastic. That's what we want to do because we're not after profits. We're after a sustainable society. Um, and the same thing happened in East Hampton. When I went in there, there was a 50% vacancy rate. I could rent for five bucks a square foot. 30 months later, when I was scraping the sign off of the windows of my office so that one of my clients could rent that space, it was 11 bucks a square foot. So young businesses come in with young people or low-income people become successful and they're victimized by their own success because their landlords then increase rent and they're out on the street. Next thing you know, it's too expensive for young businesses to come in and so that's why large chains come in. So that's what the community could do with its wealth too. Or we could partner with public research universities to develop technologies that provide solutions real solutions without planned obsolescence and without agendas that are hidden because whoever has the money controls the direction of research. And the one-tenth and of one-tenth of one percent have the money. That's where these universities get their grants from. So there's more detail on that on how the wealthy communities could work with the universities. And also these regional councils could act collectively with others around the country and the world to do even larger economic projects and take control of the economic system and move from the path we're on to the path that we really need to be on to achieve a sustainable society. So um, basically this is how the system works. And uh, we won't go in too much detail, but it's built on three, uh, three legs. The regional council, that represents the community. It's a nonprofit organization. Uh, it is the pro corporation, it is the nonprofit that holds the wealth that we're talking about. The wealth comes from businesses. Some businesses come in and donate part of their profits, small amount. Others come in and donate more, and some come in and donate equity. And then there's the community members. So essentially, community members buy from these businesses and those businesses return some money to the regional council and that regional council forms new businesses that it owns more equity in. 
So stated most simply, that's how this system works. Now, the money from the regional council, 75 stays local, 75% stays local, 20 goes national to help start other regional communities and economies, and 5% goes international to begin to create relationships around the planet on which communication and connection grow to be able to grow an economic network around this planet regardless of geopolitical borders of people and communities together because the people really want something very much different than the, po the politicians and the leaders want. So we need to connect people with people and that's what this does. Um, I wrote a book that explains all of this and um, you can have a copy of it Debbie because you, you Okay. And uh, I did call it community capitalism because my dear friend Julie, who was the economist, and she died, she got cancer and died, she said, Michael, I think you should call the book community capitalism because people were calling me a socialist and a communist. And that's the greatest way to get people to not buy into something. So I, call, I never wanted it to be an ism. That's why I gave it the designation E2M. But for the sake of initially um, grading acceptance, uh, I call it community capitalism. Now, some people hate that term, capitalism, as much as I hate that term. So I'm also rewriting the book, and we're going to call it, I think probably it'll be E2M, a model for a moral economy. And what does your E2M stand for? Uh, it never stood for anything, actually. That day, I was trying different things because Y2K was happening at that point in time, and everybody... So it kind of came, but then people said, what's it mean? So I gave it a meaning. And what it means is economic model for millennium 2000. So E is the economic model, 2M is 2000, and uh, 2 is second, and M is model. It's also East Hampton Mass, where it belongs, but that E can be many things, empowerment, uh, excitement, uh, everyone, uh, uh, emotive, uh, energy, uh, the M can be money, it can be masses, it can be movement, it can be maternal, because this is a maternal economic system. So it's a lot of things, and when I finally looked at it, I said, oh, it's better than if I had thought about it myself. So that's what it means. And essentially, um, what we did is over the next, and we're getting close to the end here, what we did essentially over the next eight years with the nonprofit e2m.org was to create all of the basic organizations, 501c3 nonprofit, another state nonprofit, and all of the policies and procedures and bylaws and everything we needed to create an alternative and operate regional alternative economic system. And so we got that done, and um, then the board said, okay, what do we do next? This is March of 2008, and they said, do we go knock on doors saying, hey, we created a new economic system, you want to join? Well, there weren't that many people then that realized we really need a new one. It crashed in 08, uh, 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 in September of that year, and that's when people began to really think, it, but so what the board, I said to the board, well, we can knock on doors, or the other thing we can do is we can create an industrial base to uh, fund each of these regional economies and create the beginnings of wealth that can create more and more wealth. And so the board said, okay, we like that idea, let's go for it. So what we did is we took the two most important components of a society. One is food and water, and the other is energy. And after that, we said, that's enough. We got the two most important, and we wanted to have an economic component, an agricultural component with an energy component that was linked into a regional economy within a um, uh, within an ultimately sustainable local economy. And so what the strategy was was to launch the system by using renewable clean fuels to grow organic crops indoors, uh, initially in inner cities, also in rural areas, employing inner city residents and the young, as young as 13, at living wages with health care and profit sharing. And over the years since then, what we did is we developed a technology that allows us to take biomass, which is wood or hemp or uh, uh, sewage waste 
uh, municipal solid waste, any form of waste, we can convert that into fuel. And carbon, the carbon that we create from wood is the same carbon that used to be in the CO2 of the atmosphere because the tree absorbs CO2, gives off oxygen, keeps the carbon. We take that carbon and turn it into a solid form and we get liquid fuels and we get a gas. And so essentially we were going from feedstock, wood, to fuel, which would be used to power generators to grow food indoors uh, as the environment gets crazy. So on um, the movement of from feedstock to fuel, this is the technology that we built in Holyoke. This cost us a million and a half dollars to build this system, which takes feedstock from here, runs it through this reactor tube under vacuum with a catalyst, to produce carbon which comes out here and then the gases that come out are converted into liquids in this machine. So we built that system. Unfortunately, my partners who were from Asia um, moved it to Asia once we proved and ran it and showed that it worked. So what we're doing right now as of this moment, uh, and it will be built shortly, is we took this $2 million system, it would have to cost five to build it completely new. And we've reduced it in size to put on a flatbed truck or on a rail car or drop it out of an airplane so that everywhere you have feedstock, whether it's in a jungle or whether it's in a disaster zone in Puerto Rico uh, or other areas, uh, we can take that feedstock and turn it into electricity and heat and ice and um, uh, energy. And the gases come out will run the system. It's called catalytic vacuum pyrolysis. These are the feedstocks it uses. This is the reactor output. That's the oils that we produce. What is the feedstock that you're putting in? The feedstock comes from a clean but waste wood. So whether it's from uh, storm damage or maintenance of power lines or natural forest, uh, um, a natural forest, uh, uh, foresting, there's 250,000 tons of forest waste every year that is produced that could be turned into carbon, which then goes into the ground to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Now, wood is one. Waste, there's, there's more waste than we know what to do with. Municipal salt, paper, and plastic. Um, and uh, we could also pull sewage waste. But what I'd really like to do is grow hemp so that we can be growing hemp. It grows in 90 days. It pulls four times more carbon out of the atmosphere than wood. We could have local farmers grow it. We could start businesses to process it, to produce seed oil, to produce seed food, to produce CBD, and other products. As hemp produces a lot of products. So we could begin to farm hemp, and I'm beginning to grow some now, to create the feedstock, but also grow new businesses. And this is one of the uh, fuels. These are, this is an example of the fuel we produce. Now, interestingly enough, biofuel, the problem with biofuel is that when it gets down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it begins to turn solid. This is the biofuel that we produce. You can see it's a liquid still, right? We pulled it out of a block of carbon dioxide, dry ice. That's 90 degrees below zero. It's still a liquid. Nothing else does that for biofuel. So that's how good our fuel is. This is the biochar. This is 12 tons of carbon, biochar, that is 90% pure carbon that used to be uh, 50 tons of CO2 in the atmosphere. So now we're cleaning the atmosphere and reversing global warming while we're producing fuels. Because the trees are taking it in and then you're burning the trees, but it's not going back. But we're not burning the trees. That's the whole right. key here. Yeah. We're right. putting the trees in a vacuum and we're heating them, driving off the cellulose and the hemicellulose and all the volatiles, and then converting those into oils, which do get burned, but it only puts back what the, what the hemp or the tree grew. So it doesn't add. It's not like taking coal from the ground and putting it, burning it, and adding CO2. So we're actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. So what is going to be done with that stuff? 
That can be used for farmers when you mix it with microbials, and we're going to show you some products we're making from it. When you mix it with minerals and microbes, you can put it in the soils and it, re it replenishes depleted soils. So this, a lot of soil is dead now from all the fertilizers that have been used, the herbicides. So essentially, large-scale farming now is almost hydroponics. The earth is dead, but you put enough fertilizer on, you can grow anything. You can grow food in cotton and rock and uh, 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 rock wool if you keep fertilizing it. That's what hydroponics is. So we're actually revitalizing the soils. You can also use it to clean water deplete uh, water leaving uh, um, uh, uh, sewage treatment plants. We can pull the contaminants out of the water. Or if we had a system in, in, in Puerto Rico, for instance, my daughter was stuck down there uh, after the hurricane, and the biggest thing they needed was ice, and they had dirty water. Not only could we produce electricity from the waste to give them energy and fuels for heat, but an electricity for refrigeration for ice, but um, we also would be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and able to use this carbon because it's like activated carbon. It'll clean out the water so they could have clean water too. You could take this and mix it with sand and grow food in the desert. You can mix this with concrete and you can reduce the negative carbon uh, impact of concrete because it's very very bad for the environment, and make it 20% stronger. You could mix it with asphalt and put it in roads, so it's still sequestered. So there's a lot of things that you, and if you type biochar into Google, you'll see what all the excitement is about. You can feed it to cattle, and it'll prevent, it'll reduce their methane from their burps and their farts by 40%. It'll clean out their systems of any aflatoxins that are in the soil. And when they poop that stuff out, it's going to have the biochar in it. The manure is going to soak into the earth, and instead of being leached away by rain, that biochar is going to have absorbed the nutrients from the manure and the bacteria from their gut, and it's going to make that land even more fertile. And that's, if you look and read about holistic farming and grazing and then moving, grazing and moving, when the cattle are, uh, are eating the biochar, that makes that even more powerful. And anecdotal evidence says that it also increases the protein to, to the grain to protein conversion so that for, for the amount of feed that normally would get four cows, you would get five. So it reduces the impact of agriculture on the environment and the impact of agriculture is very significant. So that's another thing you can do with it. You can feed it to chickens and it'll make the ammonia that they poop out. And I grew up on a chicken farm, 40,000 chickens, so let me tell you, walking into a chicken coop with 5,000 chickens in it is like walking on the moon of Saturn, Titan. It's nothing but ammonia. So what the biochar does is it allows the ammonia to be pooped out as ammonium, which is um, which is uh, a, a much better fertilizer and can be readily used on plants rather than ammonia, which will burn plants. So there's a lot of places, but if you really want a, an in-depth, and we're, we're going to talk about that too, but here's how it works. The plant absorbs CO2, exhales carbon, and retains the carbon. A tree is 41% carbon. We run that through our system, and that produces bio-oils, which displace fossil fuels too. So not only does it not harm the environment when you burn these oils, but it displaces an equal amount of fossil fuels. The biogas powers the process, and the biochar goes into the earth where it remains for millennia, thus removing carbon from the, sequence, uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere permanently, because it'll stay in the soil for thousands of years. And so these are some of the products that we're producing with the biochar that we have. And this is sold around uh, the valley, um, Virtro HM Biochar. This is Bioblast, our product. This will treat five gallons of soil. So for people that are growing a plant in soil, whether it's a food plant or a lot of people are now beginning to grow marijuana now that it's legal, in five-gallon buckets. And we're working in our space that we're renting is in a future marijuana farm in Holy, 200,000 square feet. We may be able to use our biochar in their soils as well. 
Um, uh, and here's what it does, and it's, it's a fertilizer, it's a 737 fertilizer. It increases the organic content and trace minerals in the soil. It converts barren to fertile land. It increases the microbe activity in the soil, because the microbes are now dead. It increases the oxygen, nitrogen uptake by plants. So it makes them, it'll increase the yield of plants. It provides increased surface area for bacteria to grow in the soil. It makes the ions in the soil that feed the plant move 300% faster, so you need less fertilizer, if any. It'll increase water and air retention. Biochar absorbs and holds water, so in drought times, the stuff will hold more water much longer. Um, it'll increase soil um, biomass yields, crop yields, by up to 300% reduces erosion, increases CO2 absorption of the soil, so a large part of CO2 is absorbed by the oceans and the soil. You want it to be in the soil, and so it increases that, but it also decreases the nitrogen oxide output of soil, which is also a global warming gas. It kills, it binds and deactivates soil toxins. There's a lot of toxins, aflatoxins, viruses, fungi on the soil, We've done the test and it shows that it binds to them, just like activated charcoal pulls them in and they can't move, they're, they're, they're locked in. So it makes the soil healthier, it removes CO2 from the atmosphere, it can be used as a coal substitute in power plants that use coal, and it's the reverse of coal mining. Coal mining takes old coal from the ground, burns it, puts carbon in the atmosphere. Biolysis takes carbon out of the atmosphere, creates a solid, and puts it back into the ground. So it's the reverse. This is what biochar did to this forest. This is from an academic group in South America that was, that's looking to rebuild forests. This is the former land that still exists there, and this is the land treated with biochar. So that's how, that's how we convert um, the, the, the uh, uh, um, feedstock into fuel. Here's how the fuel goes to food. We grow food indoors under highly controlled conditions which enable us to grow as much on one indoor acre as on 100 to 500 outdoor acres. And at growth rates two to five times faster than indoor growing. Here's an indoor farm. This is indoor herbs. This is herbs and medicinals. This is squash, peas, and beans. These are young tomato plants. These are squash blooms. They're 26 days old from seedlings. These are beans, 26 days old. These are peas, seeds, and beans. I took this picture on 3-4-2008. This is 26 days later. To day one, day 26. Day one, squash seedlings. Day 12, day one, day 12. We're not anti anything. We don't do boycotts. We don't do that stuff. We don't tell people or ask people, don't buy. We say, buy from these people, help this, because this company is in our system. And when you buy from this company, you're going to be contributing to the new economy. And the easy way for them, all they have to do is look for this logo. It's on all the products. So people, if they want a new world, don't have to volunteer their time because they won't. They don't have to volunteer their money because they don't have money because they're so indebted. And so all they have to do to start to create a new economic system is look for this logo on the products. And if they do the things that they do already, which is buy, even poor people buy products from companies that have this logo, and it's been shown that the public will support companies that do good things. Paul Newman showed that with his company. Nell, his daughter, is running it now after he died. But they've donated $250, $300 million to charity at this point in time. Ben and Jerry said nice things. We're going to you know, do good things with our money. People flock to Ben and Jerry's. Uh, 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 Stonyfield Yogurt said the same thing. We're a social company. We do good things. We're warm and fuzzy. But Ben and Jerry's got sold for $354 million. Did any of that go to the public? No. So if Ben and Jerry's had been in our system and they had donated 
10% of their equity like Green Cat does and like uh, the coffee used to before we put it over with the distributors. Um, uh, this community would have $35 million. So, and we could go, it depends on your time, but once you have a million people saying, yeah, we're gonna join this system. We're together, we're in the new system. We're E2Mers. When you ask a business, would you like to come into a system that has a million customers dedicated to looking for this logo? Would you like to have that logo on your product? It's going to be easy to sign up businesses. That's with even 10,000 people locally. If it was a million people regionally, even more powerful. If it was 10 million people nationally, now you go starting to talk to people like large companies, Stop and Shop, um, um, Unilever. If you get 70 million people, there's 70 million women, there's 70 million people that were either in unions or sympathize with unions. So if we could get the unions on board with this, we could get 70 million. When you have that many people that say, yeah, we're looking for this logo because we're in the new economy, now you have some serious, serious clout and you can do some amazing things and pull in huge amounts of money, which is all regional, so it's not all congealing in one place. It's spread around the country in these community economies. So it can't be attacked so easily. So if you get, so it's all about how many people can we get to say, yeah, we're in. And once you have that, you just start knocking and signing up corporations. And other corporations will say, I think I'm a young people, I want to start a business and get into this thing. So how do you get that excitement going? Through you guys. And by taking one person that gets together with three, and you have another eight or 10 or 12, and connecting with the people at Parkland and say, hey, look, we have an idea. We think we know how you can live up to that statement that you made that we're not here just about shooting kids. We're here about changing the world. Here's a way to do it. If you could connect to them, then if I were in that situation and I found um, that when I was young, your age, I thought, well, when I get older and my generation has the power, we're going to change the world. This baloney is going to end. It didn't turn out that way. And what I found out was that my idea that as time goes on and you get older, you get more power, that's not true. As time goes on, you get less power. You have the most power when you're your age. And when you get together as a group, you can be the most powerful group in this country because you have huge amounts of economic power. And that's what it's all about. That's why people spend $150 million to have stadiums named for their products. That's why 25% of the time you're watching television, you're getting advertising and they're spending a quarter of a million dollars to a million dollars to pay for that, to get a piece of your real estate to get you to buy their product. But if you all come together and say, look, we don't care about the advertising, we don't care what the name of the stadium is, this is who we're buying from, now you begin to create huge amounts of power and money and energy to change the world. So what I would do is try to connect with the other folks that really want to change the world and create a cohesive organization or initiative. Maybe it's called the American Youth Alliance. And it says, we're all getting together. The young people that were came to Washington, the kids from Parkland, the kids from North Ham, we are all getting together to form an historical organization that we're going to read about in history books 50 years from now, just like we'll read about the, uh, uh, the Occupy movement. And that's the time in human history that young people in America got together. And then when others in Europe and Asia and Australia and other parts of the world saw them, they said, us too, we want to do that too, because they're having a revolution in Armenia, my homeland. It's the young. There's a revolution trying to happen in Iran. It's the young. It's all about you guys. And you can, cha you can change the world 
if you get together. And if you get together as the American Youth Alliance, when you say, Bernie, we're having a meeting, show up, Bernie's going to show up. And when you say, um, uh, um, uh, I forget his name now, he's the head of our revolution. Oh. Larry Cohen. Yes. Larry Cohen. When you say to Larry, we're having a meeting, we want you to show up. Now, Larry used to be the head of the CIO. Now, I spoke to a union group in 2004 and talked about this. And I said to them, look, the age of organizing to get more people to come into unions is over. But what you did with that age is you created huge amounts of wealth because in 2001 when 50 percent of the people owned half of all the liquid investable capital there was 17 trillion dollars of liquid investable capital the ultra rich owned 8.5 trillion unions owned 1 trillion through their pension funds and the rest of the population owned the balance and of that 20% owned 80%, so it's still concentrated. Well, I said to the union organizations, what you could consider doing, rather than trying to unionize existing companies, is start new companies with young people and entrepreneurs with a different vision. You come in as the investor. That eliminates the union management adversary adversarial relationship because no entrepreneur is in an adversarial relationship with their investors and you're with the people you're with the working people so you're going to be willing to give them ownership in the company and you've got 70 million followers out there they not may not all be union members but they sympathize and if you say this is what we're doing buy from these companies you're going to have 70 million people as a population that could buy from these companies and energize them and produce huge amounts of wealth and they said to me wow would you would you please come and talk to our group this was a, a, a speech i gave at the uh, boston social forum in 2004 and i said i'm not ready yet it's an idea right this second. We need to finish the, the uh, um, bylaws and the detail work and things like that. But they were very interested. And so if the American Youth Alliance says, look, Larry, we'd like to have you down and uh, talk to you about something, Larry's going to show up. And anybody that you ask to come down is going to show up because you have that power of all the young people around you. You can make that happen. It's right to do it right now because it's only been weeks since that march. And people are looking for a way to now move to the next step. And I know you folks have done some stuff to help Safe Passage and other things, the thing, uh, uh, other conversations the communities happen at. And that's all great stuff. But you also, in addition to doing the local things, need to think on a global basis and a national basis and go for the power that you have on your terms because you can do this without any need for any new legislation without the approval of the government without there's nothing stalking you the world you want is yours for the taking you can take it you don't have to be a politician that's like I'm gonna go to Washington to fight for you why would you ever fight for something that you could take that's yours for the taking. And that's where your generation is at this point in time. And it happens to be you guys, because in another 10 years, it's going to be too late. Because what's going on now on this planet is happening so quickly that this is the window of opportunity. And it's you guys that are in that window, and you can make it happen. And so that's what I wanted to tell you. And if you're interested, I'd love to sit down with Gabe and Jose and others and put a plan together to say, hey, how do we do this? Let's go for it. Because if somebody doesn't, just read the newspapers. It's not getting better out there. And there are some serious people out there that are now saying, look, if we don't do something about the environment, we're not going to be around in 50 years. Now, I don't know if that's right or wrong. But all I know is they never talked about that stuff when I was a kid. 
and they never said that the things that we thought that would take a hundred years, the bad things to happen, are now already happening in 20 years. Things are accelerating, and so we can't wait. There's no waiting about it. Politics, they're not going to do it. Politics is not the answer. We went from Obama to Trump, and two weeks after he came in, stuff that had been taken 20 years to build was disassembled. Henry A. Wallace was the vice president to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt was the most loved president of all time at that point. Henry Wallace, his um, uh, vice president, they didn't run as a team, as a ticket back in those days, they ran separately. Henry had a 65% public approval. He was a pacifist. He was opposed to war. And he went into the 1944 Democratic Convention, and when he walked into the room, it was like Bernie walking into um, that uh, uh, mass mutual center. And the delegates were screaming, I have videos of it. And he said, there should be equal pay for equal work, regardless of race or sex. And the crowd went crazy. They were screaming, I have videos of it. And the Democratic National Committee bosses didn't like him because he was a pacifist, so they put Harry Truman in, who went on to drop the bomb on Japan and start the Cold War with Russia by attempting to, threatening to annihilate them. Now, if Henry Wallace had been vice president, he would have assumed the presidency when Roosevelt died, and we would have a completely different planet at this point. Now, Roosevelt was a Democrat, Wallace was a Democrat, and Congress was controlled by the Democrats. That's 75 years ago, and they're still saying we should have equal pay for equal work. Well, if it didn't happen from that platform, it ain't going to happen now. That's where politics is getting us, nowhere. It's all about the money. It's all about the power, and you guys have the power to accumulate the money and create a really fantastic new initiative that can change this world. For the taking, you just have to want to do it. That's all. If you want to do it, it's yours. So questions, comments, whatever, if I can answer anything, just let me know if you have doubts or uh, 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 questions of how, then here we are. Yeah, do you have any questions, Helen? Yeah, I do. So, you're saying like if it gets bigger, then bigger companies can join on. So, is your idea that hopefully like large companies will be part of it? Because like if you want to keep small businesses, it seems sort of contradictory. Well, you'll never get rid of large businesses because a small local business is unlikely to be able to produce an automobile very soon. Um, it's also the large businesses that are doing most of the damage. So, yes, you can bring them in. We, we don't say no to people. They may have to donate 10% of their equity to get into the system, but once you have huge numbers of people, they have to come in. And when they come in, we're going to use their money to build smaller businesses. So we're, it's essentially like economic judo. We're going to use the current economic system with its power sources and to draw energy and power from them to use to change that system. And yes, once you get millions of people together, you can begin to do things with public corporations that essentially allow you to take them over. Because if you own 5% of a public corporation, you control its agenda. Because that's a very powerful voting block. So as we get more regions around the country and we use that 20% that we use nationally to say, let's go after Ford Motor Company, the first thing you do is say to Ford, look, if you produce an automobile with, that meets these requirements, we'll all buy one the next time we buy it. And there's 70 million of us. What's Ford going to do? Say, I get out of here. 
you're going to be able to, with that economic power you have, begin to get them to do the things you want. Okay. And so if you, you're saying using that system of kind of going in and going out to like get them on board, but then once you had like lots of gas companies on board, you would, like people could use them all equally, because it doesn't seem good to like only use one no. gas company, but that's just a way to persuade them to join. Well, here's the thing. You have to ask the question. There's lots of competition out of there. There can be too much competition. So half of the companies that are out there that are exist are only there to produce profits. Their, profit, their products are useless or junk. So we wouldn't take all of the oil companies. You have to kind of tell them, look, we're only going to take five because you have to put them under the pressure to get in while the getting's good. So if you limit it, it's okay to limit it. They'll grow. The others are going to disappear. And those people will go into other companies that will form. Those will be the employees to new, smaller companies that do joint ventures with the new companies, the larger companies that are formed. You use their power. I did a joint venture with the largest company in the world. So huge companies can spin off many small. We could say, if we control Gulf, and we could say, we're going to use biofuel now. Because you can take our oil that we produce and mix it with petroleum crude and run it through the same refining process together and every bit of gasoline, kerosene, jet fuel that comes out of the reef is going to have that bio component. So if you control Gulf, you could say, look, we want a million of you to grow hemp out there and we're going to buy your hemp oil. We're going to set up systems to convert the hemp to oils, and we're going to use those oils as crude. So all of the money that's going to Saudi Arabia now goes to farmers. And so with the power of their distribution systems, you can do amazing things. So even though they're evil now, they're evil because they demand maximizing profit and growth for the investor. And a lot of those managers in there and people that work for them, they come from loving families, they hug their partners when they leave and they go to work, and when they get there they do things that they hate to be doing, lay off 5,000 people, because if they don't, they're going to be out on the street, because the law requires large corporations to be greedy. So once you begin to build that non-greed component and you control the agenda of that corporation, you can do wonderful things, so yeah, we want them in there. So, even if five, like there's only like five main gas companies that ET um, members were supporting, like your idea was they wouldn't be like corrupt and like greedy because they would be supporting like the initiatives that ET is supporting and they'd be donating and like having better well, values. Let's. I'll take the last half and say, oh, that's going to happen. Will they? Be corrupt and greedy, you're still going to have some of that, but you're going to get your piece of it. And get the money. That it's all about the money, Gabby. It's all about the money. Cala. Cala. Okay, I'm sorry, Gabby. <laughs> it's all about the money. This initiative is only about money. If you control the capital, you control the planet. So we only talk about money. We don't say they have to use recycled paper. They don't, we don't say you can't buy bananas from uh, 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 um, uh, South America. We don't do that. It's all about the money. Then when the community has enough money to spin off their own businesses, now when the community council forms a new business as a friendly venture capital investor, it owns half of that company. It's not just taking a half a percent of the profit. It's not just taking a half a percent of, of one product line. It's not just taking 5% uh, 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 of equity. It's now owning 50% of the new company. So you use these smaller donations initially to spin off companies that you own half of. And then you use those, because you're going to make even more money off of that, to spin off more companies. So you use small donations to create enough money to make a larger don investment that's going to create more equity in the, for the community. And as the community members buy from that company, there's a component in that company that outside investors can still come in. 
So let's say the community council owned 10%, and let's say the employees owned 40%. There's still room, or let's say the community council owned 20% and the employees owned 40%. Uh, there's still 40% out there that investors can come in and invest, but they don't control the agenda now. And that's how these companies start with a little bit of money, and the greed of investors coming into these new companies creates wealth for the community too. So essentially what E2M does is it says we can't eliminate human greed. We can't eliminate human corruption, but we can eliminate a greedy economic, we can create a non-greed-based economic system. So if you can remove the greed from the system, even though you have greedy people involved, you still achieve your main goal, which is to create a sustainable, loving, caring planet that takes care of everybody. For E2M, it's only about the money. We don't tell a company, if you want to come into the system, you have to use recycled paper or you can't sell bananas. We don't, put, we don't demand any value change from them. Because as soon as you say to an entrepreneur, you, you can come into our system, but you've got to do this or do that. And if that company donates equity to the community, that's non-voting stock. Because no entrepreneur, and I'm one of them, is going to let the community come in and form a committee to control their company. So it's all non-voting stock. But those people have made their donation. That's what we want. We want the equity. But now, when the community has enough money to spin off a new business, it can then say, this business is going to have the following values. So we don't demand values from people that come in the system or they won't come in. Yeah. We create values when we form our companies. Yeah. And the types of people that will come in, knowing that there's those values are the types of people you want running new companies. E2M is not the only solution. E2M is about money. Yeah. So we also, let's assume there was no E2M, and that wasn't in the toolbox. You're exactly right. We have to do something about those companies. Yeah. But we've been saying that for 20 years, too. Right. And if there's a way to do it, that should be happening too. E2M doesn't right. preclude that from happening. Uh -huh. So there still needs to be activism out there and demands on these companies and things like that. But if also they have an internal component of stockholders, which is the community, that are supportive of that, you're going to get them to do those things even faster. Because right. I can pretty much assure you that the oil in the ground is not going to stay in the ground under the current economic system. It's coming out. Yeah. So the best thing to do is begin to pro control their agenda so that they're using biofuels created by farmers around the country in their system too, which over time, if they could use all locally created crude oil to do their, they would do that. The only reason they're buying from over there is because that's where the oil is. So, and then we could use that oil to do different things like create plastics that we can use to create highways or create construction bricks for homes and things like that rather than burning it as fuel. So now you say, no, you're not going to use that oil to burn it. You're going to use that oil to create polymers that are going to do other things and you're going to use biofuels for fuel and heat to burn. And they're quite willing to do that because it doesn't impact their profit negatively. Mm -hmm. It improves it, because yeah. now they have a new source of oil. So now they have more feedstock for their system, so they'll make more money. Yeah. So you have to do that while you're also doing whatever else you can do to kind of twist their arms into doing the right thing. Yeah. But it's, there's not a whole lot of time to do arm twisting. Trump just lifted the regulations on coal. He's changing regulations left and right. It's not going in a better direction. It's going in a worse direction. So um, while you're doing whatever you can to stop that from happening, doing this 
to create the power of millions of people and billions of dollars, you may find that it's a more convincing argument for these companies that are required by law to do bad things. I'll give you a quick example. Craig Newmark started Craigslist. Mm -hmm. This was a social enterprise. He wanted to use this company to do good things. Yeah. But he sold 25% of it to eBay because he needed the money to get his company going. Uh -huh. And not all that long ago, eBay said to Craig, hey Craig, you're being too socially oriented. You're not maximizing our profit and growth, our profits. You have to stop being a social company and we want you to maximize profits. And Craig said, no way. And so they sued him. Newmark versus, eBay versus Newmark. It went to the courts. The judge finally said to Craig, you know, I really understand what you're doing, young man. I'm really impressed that you would do things like that with your company. However, the law is clear. The investor, your obligation as a corporation, your legal requirement is to maximize profit and growth for the investor. eBay, you win. Mm -hmm. eBay versus Newmark. Check it out. Okay. So you've got to respond to that by creating powerful, powerful investors and consumers, young people, the Eight, the 15 to 34 year old category is the largest buying category of the public. They're spending billions and trillions of dollars to get a piece of your real estate to buy their products. That's how important it is. So um, you have to go for large, you have to spin off thousands of small businesses, tens of thousands of small businesses, but it takes capital to do that. And as you start spinning those off, then you begin to create even more capital. And ultimately, you have a society where communities control the corporations, and the purpose of these corporations is to create a dignified lifestyle for everybody. It can happen. Yeah. And if it doesn't, we're in trouble. Yeah. Do you think E2M could be successful? even if it stayed on a small scale? You can do it locally, and that's it's in another good question that you ask, because my question is, well, you know, Michael, you don't have to try to see this thing become a globally powerful system. You can do things locally. And yes, that can happen, but you've just limited its power. And uh, you can have, like the first slide said, you can have a sustainable business, but you can't have a sustainable business in an unsustainable economy. So you have to do the whole thing too. Right. I wish it could be enough that you could do it locally, and we are. And your group can be a big part of that to kind of set an example. But there's really not a lot of time yeah. to create the massive systemic change that the young folks in Parkland were talking about and uh, do it quick enough to avoid some of the things that are happening. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to think locally, yes, but you have to act globally too. Right. So you can do both at the same time. Yeah. And when you do it globally, they're waiting all over the planet. They're waiting in Sydney. They're waiting in Tiananmen Square. They're waiting in London, they're waiting in Paris, just like they did with uh, uh, Jose and Occupy. They're saying, what can we do? Yeah. Take us there. Our generation is waiting for your generation. You're our last hope. The money that goes to the communities, council, half of that money is designated as to where it's going to be spent by the employees of the company, including the owner of the company. That person gets one vote. Everybody gets a vote. So half of the money that's going to the council is designated by the employees. Okay. 
So they're going to do the local things. They're going to try to help that young girl that needs a lung transplant. Mm -hmm. They're going to do things to help safe passage. Yeah. So that's where the charitable component comes in. The other half is controlled by the council. 75% mm -hmm. of it stays local. Of that 75% that's spent locally, 72 has to go to buy to start new companies. The other 18%, 28%, they can do with whatever they want. Okay. Charitable things. Uh, um, so that's what happens to 75% of the money that the council controls. 20% of the money that the council controls mm -hmm. goes nationally to help others form regional councils. Okay. And 5% of it goes internationally. And even on these thin webs of communication, 50 bucks to South America doesn't do a whole lot, but it creates communication between two people. And on those very ethereal lines, business develops, communication, and that's how the net grows around the planet. So yeah, it does happen, both things. You get social components and you do get, but again, it's all about the money that really makes things happen. You yeah. could you can either fish feed them f f feed the poor, or you can teach them how to fish. So you have to do both, and that's how we accomplish that by making half of it designated by the employees of the company, because that's what they're going to be thinking of. They're going to think of local causes. Right. Are you trying to get people part of ETM, e ETM, or just buying ETM products or both? Both. Okay. But so we just want we just want them to say we're in, uh -huh. and so if we could get a mailing that says that signs the pledge on the website, and we have to do some work on that, that says yeah we're 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 in, and we're going to be looking for that logo. Uh -huh. Now, if we could issue a card, that would be better. If we could say anybody could come in for no money, just say you're gonna, and that's it's all about getting the mailing list. But those of you who want uh, other things. We don't know what that. You could pen, spend twenty bucks a year and become a card carrying or a paying member. That's another way. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is if they say, "Yeah, we're in, and we're going to buy wherever we see that logo," and they've signed the uh, pledge, and we have their name and email, so that we can communicate with them and tell them. Because we'd have a separate website now. That's e2mnet.org. Uh -huh. Go to this website, buy from the companies on this. It would be like Amazon. Okay. Wow. These are all the companies that are in the system. So all you have to do is go buy from them. Uh -huh. So you make it easy for people. Because the idea is we want to create maximum impact with minimum effort on the part of the community. Uh -huh. Because they're too overwhelmed and too impoverished or indebted to really do much more. Uh -huh. So the easiest thing they can do is buy. So you're just right now trying to get businesses? No, we're trying to get the mailing list, number one. Okay. We're trying to get some promotion for it. That's where you guys come in. Uh -huh. And to get the word out. That's why going from one to three to uh, the whole group down there to eventually millions, that adds to the mailing list. Mm -hmm. That adds to the power that we have of consumer power. And you have the Regional Economic Council. We formed the, re here's what happened, we formed the Regional Economic Council years back. We had 18 people on it. But then the board said, look, let's start, let's get the industrial base. So, uh, and we're going to go kind of into hibernation until that's figured out. Uh -huh. So now we know what the industrial base is. Everything has been proven. The technology has been proven. We built a large system for a million and a half, ultimately two million bucks. We're building a small system. Now it's time to get back to the original vision. Now we know what the industrial base is. Let's revitalize the board. Let's reform the economic council and take who's still, that might still be there. Some have gone off and they were young people, so they've gotten married, they've moved out of the area, they have kids. So it's now time to re-energize that part of it. And that's why I'm here talking to you, not to investors to come into the okay. industrial component. So that now needs to happen. Okay. Yeah. But we've shown that it could happen. And we had the University of Massachusetts, the Student Government Association, 18,000 students represented. Uh, support this and pass a resolution for it in 2004. And what our 
tactic back then was to get the university to buy local goods from local people and producers, specifically milk from, uh, um, from um, uh, the farm on Hadley, in Hadley, Maple Line Farm. And so that was the agenda item in 2004. We were talking about the university buying local years before it started happening. And back then, John Peterson, I think his name is, we talked to him and said, this is what we want the university to do. He said, there's no structure for us to do that.